uh, Iowa was um, was an absolutely fabulous experience. It started me to becoming a, a fully realized person as to who I was, what I was interested in, and what I might do. I think so many on the call today probably share that sentiment in terms of, of, the, of feeling like Iowa maybe played a role in becoming that fully realized person. I absolutely mm -hmm. love that. And uh, I, I think that's, that's so true. That's so true. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit, you mentioned being a, a political science major along with a history major. And um, you had the opportunity to be at the University of Iowa during the 60s. And I know that had to be such an incredible time, um, especially when it comes to political science and the atmosphere around campus. Uh, can you shine a little light on your experience there uh, during that era? Yes, it was. It was a fascinating time. I, um, one of the things I liked about Iowa, when I figured I'd get, and I did, was that the science was right so that I'd be able to engage professors. And political science and history and some of these other departments were, that I took were always willing to do that. So I got involved into everything from, um, you know, the interfraternity things to the campus politics. I ran a campaign to uh, the national and state level. And uh, I was encouraged to do that by the department. I was given an opportunity, for example, to write an occasional column for the Daily Iowan on politics, which was hugely fun. And the same way with history. You know, it was a chance to explore everything, ancient history, Latin American, you name it. And, uh, but I kept up with that political part because then they referred me to uh, being the part of the campus team of the congressman from the area then. So I did that and was able to work in Washington with him for a while and was able to visit there. I got involved with other programs that way and was able to go to a leadership program in New York City. So lots of doors were opened uh, by my activity. Gosh, and that, got to know lots of people that way. That network, that, that yeah, network exactly. that was developed and grown right there from the time at the University of Iowa, obviously the ripple effect that it had on your life, on your career, uh, it, that's just outstanding. And I appreciate you sharing a bit about that. I. Uh, moving into looking at your career, it's the resume I know I touched on. I probably only scratched the surface when I when I introduced you, and um, it it is profound. It is it is rich. And could you touch on a little bit about uh, some of your highlights since your graduation from the University of Iowa? Some of, of what you've accomplished um, throughout your life. Well, part of it was, of course, I did my master's at the University of Iowa, and Malcolm Rohrbaugh, my professor, I still see him from time to time. He sometimes comes to Southern California. So there was that, and then there was that connection that way. And then when I graduated, or was ready to graduate, uh, the Congressman had been reelected. So he asked me to join his staff, staff then. But I said, I don't wanna be ABD. So he said, well, let me know when you're ready to find something. So when I was, I said, would you write me a letter of recommendation? He did, and I think that's what helped me get a job in Washington, D.C. So there was, you know, that kind of connection again. Absolutely. The, the kind of the relationship building that's done between professor and student, between student and student, between the extracurriculars that you participated in. It's just there was, there's no end. It's, it's kind of, it's so interesting to see the web that kind of spans oh. upon after graduation that you can kind of take, you can follow back to a specific moment at your time at the University of Iowa. That's well, yeah, and then that, you, meet, really you, know, you meet those people and you make the other connections. Well, it was the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and, and uh, then that ripple effect goes out because during that time, I began to find the things that led me not only back and forth into academics, but also I found out that I liked fundraising. So that helped my career as well because I've been a museum director. And I've also headed several foundations. So it's been the ability, I think, to adapt, to sort of reinvent myself because I've met so many, you know, I started at Iowa learning to meet people from other parts of the United States, New Jersey or California or 
uh, London or wherever they happen to be from. And yeah, that's an incredible experience. That's amazing. And you, touching on a little bit about, you, you had mentioned the opportunity that you were afforded to work in Washington, D.C. Can you um, share a little more about your time uh, working with the congressman? And, and um, I believe it was, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Congressman Fred Schwegel, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you touch on a little bit about your, your time then? Yeah, a fabulous time. Uh, he and his wife, Ethel, were just wonderful people. Absolutely wonderful. So I remember going to their home for dinner and they're introducing me to things and uh, having lunch with him and some other representative or senator in the, you know, the Senate dining room, riding the little rail that goes between them, and, uh, getting to know other staffers on the Hill. But when I came back after my doctorate, was working at the archives and was uh, interning at the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress, we we'd be back in touch. So a lot of what went on uh, just brought back those connections that I had had. And I was in a very interesting position at the archives. I was work working for the uh, Office of Presidential Libraries. Wow. So in that particular point, we had a historical office uh, that I went to uh, for as part of my job uh, in the uh, old executive office building right next to the White House. Wow. And uh, I, it was like being a fly on the wall of politics. Even in the elevators, people you would see. I mean, it's, it's a very exciting milieu. I can only imagine how, what you learn day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute uh, during your time there in DC. Um, I don't want to bury the lead, obviously, I think uh, one thing on everybody's mind right now is chocolate. They, I think they're excited about this program to learn a little bit. And I would love to learn from you on how, uh, obviously your, your resume is tremendous and the experience that you were, that you've had uh, through many different positions. You mentioned being a fundraiser, being a collecting, collections manager for museums. How did you, where does your, where did your passion for chocolate stem from? And um, how did you kind of take that path in your career? Well, my first taste of it was just like everybody's. It was, I was a probably five or six on my grandmother's dairy farm in Wisconsin. In a separate room, she had a wood stove, which she would use exclusively for baking because she knew it could rise here or you could put it there or however. Because I guess I was the quietest grandson at the time anyway. She would invite me to come in when she did some of the rolls. And she would always put a piece of chocolate in there. And that's, you know, then it would melt. But very French. I, even today, I love perhaps in the morning or the afternoon, take a piece of toast and put some thinly sliced chocolate on top of that and let it melt a little bit, maybe with a little butter underneath it. Great snack. But anyway, that sticks in your mind. And that's what happens. The ingredients in a cacao bean are the perfect com uh, combination for your brain. It's about 55% fat, about 50%, varies a little bit depending upon where the bean is from, uh, solids. So you get all those things like serotonin and theobromin and the dozens and dozens of vitamins in there and the magnesium and the brain picks up on it and stores it. It loves that combination. So then the brain will tell you that you need that when you maybe see it, or particularly, and it's been tested this way, if somebody gives you chocolate, because of that good feeling that you get, you're inclined to be more open to them, which is one of the reasons chocolate was so popular when they were courting back in the late 1800s. And still, People exchange chocolate for different reasons. So you get that and you never forget it. Culture, which, which uh, sticks. While I was in high school, invite friends. And it was usually probably just a batch of spaghetti or something. But I always would make a, uh, a chocolate dessert of some kind. And that carried on after I went to uh, the graduate school and went to then got married and had people in for dinner. I loved to entertain from the time. One of my cookbooks 
is loaded with autograph. I mean, you know, people signing it going way back. So that was there, but you know, I was focusing on other things as a museum director or whatever, but I always was maintained that interest. Some of my travels to Oaxaca, uh, you know, to Mexico City, to the Caribbean, I would always try to get involved with the local chocolate if I could. So finally, after going through a number of these things and leaving my final job at, uh, in San Francisco, I went to, uh, I said, I'm just gonna get away. So I moved to Hawaii and there I got to know growers and I got to watch the process and i had been tasting more. But you know, dark chalk, which is the best, really is an attraction for us only within about the last three years. So it was an opportunity. So then I had an opportunity to come back here and become a, to study as a reader at the Huntington and do my, begin my research. And then in 2015, I was able to join the Osher Lifelong Learning Program at UCLA as a lecturer. And of course it had to be on chocolate. Absolutely. Tastings in every class. And I will uh, Skype or now Zoom in growers or people from around the world. And so, cause most people come to a class like that or come to listen to me in a private lecture, whatever it is. And they, they, they know they like chocolate, but they probably only have had chocolate candy. And that means you're getting almost 98% sugar and maybe a few nuts and things. So once you start them into it, then I try to take them through the steps of where it came from, why it was processed, why it's so wonderfully medically, because you know, it was only a couple of years ago, they started to test it for Alzheimer's and that it may be able to have some effect. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would say to your audience, the first thing you do if you like chocolate, pick up the bar if you're buying artisanal chocolate and read the wrapper. And if it doesn't have 70% on it on the front or the back, and if it starts out with sugar as the first ingredient, forget it. You're not forget really it. in chocolate. <laughs> so that's why. But it is the world's craved, most craved food because it offers the body and mind so many things that the brain loves. Absolutely. And, you know, you, I, I will say in my personal life, I'm a novice when it comes to chocolate. But I, I will say now moving forward, that I will be substituting that breakfast of champions, bowl of Wheaties, for some toast with a couple pieces of chocolate. You've inspired me in that regard, Ali. So thank you there. Make but it's so interesting. What was higher, that? I'm sorry. Higher percentage. Higher percentage. And that's if the important part. The uh, yeah. and also it was, it's so interesting to hear. You're not getting the the flavanols. I think that's where so many of us as um, that don't have the experience with chocolate, maybe maybe are missing out a little bit. So thank you for providing that insight. And um, you answered one of my questions was going to be, uh, what is during your lectures, during your classes, when you're kind of introducing this whole new world of chocolate to a student, I was going to ask what's one of the first things that you look for, but can you go a little bit deeper into what the structure of your course looks like, your, your lecture? Uh, kind of looks like and what you what you do look to teach and instill in your students? Well, I try, um, I, I teach varieties of the course. I teach everything from the 5,000 year history of how chocolate conquered the world to tasting courses or short courses. But it's one thing, you know, you can talk to them, you can show them pictures, you can have people talk to them. But from the beginning, I want them to taste it because Usually what they've had is maybe a Hershey's candy bar, let's say, which has a tenth of an ounce of chocolate in it, in the milk chocolate. So you're not getting much chocolate, you think you are. So it's a combination of taste and learning about the culture and why it is so attractive to people. And then learning about the different kinds, because it's like wine, you know, it has terroir. It depends on where it's grown and what the conditions are. And it only grows 20 degrees north or 20 degrees south of the equator. And even there, the beans will differ. So you can get really technical 
but I try to cover it so they have plenty of time for questions, not only of me, but of the people that make it and growers and so forth. So that's just sort of a quick summary. Absolutely. I, I'm so thankful that you can provide that. And that's an amazing, I want to, I wish we had that course available uh, to us. Maybe with the Zoom technology, we can Zoom bomb one of your courses at some point, because I think it would just be incredibly interesting. And um, But you mentioned question, being available for questions to your students. Yes. We've had quite a few questions come into Q&A. Um, and so I would, I, again, to anybody out there that has a question uh, for Lee, uh, please enter it in there. We'll be sure to try and get through as many as possible. But uh, Lisa, uh, one of our viewers, uh, she asked, I've heard about pink chocolate in recent years. And I think I've seen some of that as well I, uh, as a thing to enjoy. Can you tell us a little bit more about where pink chocolate comes from and how it's processed and what gives it that color? Well, it, it's, um, it's a design program that was started by some of the larger manufacturers. Okay. And it's still used, I mean, by artisanal and others because there's a white, you know, there's white chocolate, which is, basically not chocolate at all because it's all the cocoa butter. And then you have the pink, you have dark, and the dark varies from FDA standards all the way to 100%. But it's, that one is, to me, not my favorite chocolate. Oh, simply because I don't think it provides you with enough of the real chocolate experience. That I will sense. say, I tell my students, you know, it's not my taste, it's your taste that you have to satisfy. So I'm glad she's trying it, but I hope Lisa will go and try. We should ask her what the percentage is she's looking at, because if there's no percentage on the bar, then she's not getting much out of it. So would you, would you recommend for anybody just starting off, the percentages is key in terms of the amount of cacao or the amount of chocolate, <clears throat> legitimate chocolate being in a bar? Yes. And I would say that and, and reading the back of the bar. Reading back sometimes there'll be two ingredients, sometimes there'll be more. I mean, if you look at chocolate candy, that's the confectioner side. That's always going to have a lot more sugar and it's going to have a lot more chemicals. There's some of them that are mostly chemicals. They sure. use palm oil or they use some kind of vegetable oil. Uh, and that is not real chocolate to me. Well, you may, have, you may have just answered this by what you just said, but we had another question come in uh, from Jay, actually a leader of one of our Iowa clubs in the central Illinois area. A special shout out to the Bloomington Normal uh, area there. Uh, he asked if a candy bar, a milk chocolate or a Hershey's milk chocolate candy bar, for example, has so little actual cacao in it, what gives the, the bar its chocolate flavor? Is it those chemicals that you just touched on or uh, is there a specific way they're getting that chocolate flavor out in a bar? That well, it doesn't have chocolate? There's, there's a whole range of, I'll try not to make this too technical because it's a very good question. <clears throat> but there's sort of the poor man's chocolate, which is for sterile. That's what the manufacturers use. You're going to get a chocolate flavor there. But most of it is an illusion because it has so many other ingredients in it. It's not that it doesn't have a flavor, but that's why you have to look at the better beans and the higher quality to really get what chocolate is. And it can be fruity, it can be floral, it can be earthy. There's something like 500 flavors in a cacao bean and a chocolate that you can get. Not in a bar, but you, know, you can possibly get. So yeah, I would say to him that he's definitely getting some chocolate, but what he's mostly getting is sugar, uh, powdered milk probably, and maybe a little cocoa butter, maybe some palm oil, maybe a vegetable oil. Um, that's mostly what he's getting. And the reason men in particular chew it a lot and gulp it is because they think they're after the chocolate, but they're really looking for that sugar. Okay. I know we probably become conditioned. Sorry, I did not mean to cut you off there. We probably become conditioned to, there's so much sugar in so many of our foods. Yes. I think maybe that, is that where we kind of lean or just automatically go to where our brains are almost yeah. conditioned to, to hunt that? Oh, yeah. I mean, 
Uh, there was a French doctor in the 1740s who first said, if you, if you have too much sugar, it'll kill you, meaning white refined sugar. And yet from the statistics I've seen, the average American had, consumes 42 teaspoons of sugar a day. Now that's besides what they may get in natural sugars. So yes, sugar is very, and it'll change your digestive system as well. Just amazing, just another reason to, to shift and to try and find the real, the real deal. So yeah, uh, that's just, amazing. Um, another question we had come in um, is through your travels, we touched on a little bit in the, in the introduction of, of where you've gone. You mentioned moving to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, where has been your favorite place so far that you visited uh, in the world of chocolate, that chocolate's brought you to? Well, it, it's just like I say when people, when my students ask me what my favorite chocolate bar is, I will usually say, well, on any given day, I may have 10 or 12 that appeal to me because I am trying to taste. But there's some experiences that are just well worth it. For example, uh, if you go to Hawaii, you get a cacao that ranges everywhere from what they call the Pluto of cacao because Kauai gets so cold, it almost doesn't grow. The big island, the main island, again, it's that tier one. Uh, Taiwan has some wonderful chocolate because it's grown in the southern part of it. The cacao from the fine flavor cacao from countries like Colombia and Peru and Ecuador uh, is extremely good. And to all my other chocolate friends out there, I'm not denying that there aren't wonderful other chocolate areas. Uh, and going to Paris, you know, there's something about going to Paris. But the Parisian, the, the fine French chocolate makers give you a whole different experience. One of the best in the world is in Copenhagen. And absolutely fabulous. So you, there's an Australian family that I know in Nicaragua, great chocolate. Uh, another acquaintance is in the uh, cloud forest areas of Mindo, Peru. And that gives you a different flavor. So as you travel, like if you go to Oaxaca, that was that area of Soconosco and so forth. That was where the finest chocolate in ancient times came from. So much so good was it that the king of Spain had to keep it in his crown jewel area for 300 years. <laughs> so you just, you have to, you just, you have to taste folks. If you go to Grenada, there's some wonderful chocolate there. Trinidad and Tobago. These countries in that zone around the world from 20 degrees north and 20 degrees south of the equator. If you're in any of those, Fiji, Guadalcanal, the Solomon Islands, any of those, you should try the chocolate. 100%. And I think we've just created the ultimate bucket list of <laughs> places to go. I, I don't know Maybe. if it gets any better than that. I, a you question that came. Go ahead. Sorry, go on. No, no. I was just going to say, have an Iowa alumni chocolate tour somewhere. I think you've just written our next, or come up with our next alumni engagement uh, program and we're all able to get together in person again. I know my colleague from international programs is on this uh, on this show, so uh, I'll, I think we could lead the way in terms of a, a you know a debut program as we come back. I don't think it would get any better than that. I would be interested to know very much so what Iowans, uh, what alumni of the university are involved in the chocolate business. Sure. Because it is practically a $190 billion business when you consider all aspects of it. And there are people globally. So if any of you are out there, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. If there is anybody on the call today, please uh, mention that in the question and answer portion here. We had another question and we probably got time for just a couple more, but okay. um, I had a question come in from Carolyn who I think this stems directly off of what you touched on in terms of your travels. How does climate change impact the production and growth of the, of the cacao bean? Is that, I, it obviously plays such a huge role. How does it? Well, for example, um, right now, one of the areas it's hardest hit is Africa, which produces about 70% of the world's chocolate, cacao for chocolate. And it's, it's in a combination of 
sort of the temperatures are shifting, the, the rainfall is declining, and the cacao tree is a very vulnerable tree. It doesn't like too much water, it doesn't like too dry, doesn't like it too hot, doesn't like it too cold. Uh, it's a member of the, the evergreen species. So that growth area is going to be shifting. It'll probably never go away. Um, it's just, for example, in Japan, they have greenhouses, specially constructed and typhoon proof to grow some cacao. So it doesn't mean you can't grow it someplace else, but it's extremely difficult and costly. But yes, climate change is definitely going to alter the taste and the growing areas. Uh, it's starting, but no one knows for sure. It's not going to go extinct, but. Well, it's so interesting to see, and you, you touched on this very well, uh, how, you know, how climate change is going to play a role, but how different climates also play a role in the travels that you've done. Um, you had also talked a little bit about how chocolate was used in courtship. And, it, you know, a question that came in that kind of makes me think about that is um, we had somebody ask a little bit about wine tasting and how it, your description of chocolate tasting reminds them of wine tasting and how yes. those two have really paired uh, many times throughout, throughout history, chocolate and wine. Can you talk a little bit about how those different flavors kind of complement each other and, and why they complement each other, how that even how that even comes about? Well, again, it depends upon that combination of terroir and the chocolate. But some wines, like I have found most white wines do not really go with chocolate. I think one of the best things with, that goes with chocolate if you're drinking is a dark beer. They're natural. In fact, a number of manufacturers put chocolate in their dark beers. Uh, chocolate can be paired very nicely with cheeses. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. But again, it's that sense of, well, just, you know, it's like anything else you taste. Would you put mustard on a strawberry? Well, probably not. But you, that doesn't mean you shouldn't experiment. I know, I know of a cider maker in Long Beach who is developing chocolate in cider. So I'm really interested to see how that comes up. This chocolate Ooh. festival I'm working out, we are going to have a dark beer tasting with chocolate and probably with cider. I love the idea of how versatile chocolate is with not only beverages, but also foods, cheeses you mentioned. It's just incredible. And it's another aspect of discovery for each and every one of us to find what you like. You mentioned, would you put mustard on a strawberry? Probably not, but there's somebody out there that maybe absolutely loves the combo and you could maybe find the same absolutely. with chocolate, with cheese, things like that. It's incredible. Um, the final question that I have for you has maybe been asked more times than any other question today. Uh, and then this may be a, the toughest question of the day for you. It might be like picking your favorite family member. What is your favorite chocolate? As I say, there's usually about 10 or 11 or 12. I, sure. I think one I would definitely uh, name a Saint du Chocolat in Paris. That's one of the finest bars. If you're in New York or there's a couple other cities, you can stop by their shop and get a cup of hot chocolate. Now remember, there's two different kinds of hot. There's hot cocoa with cocoa powder and there's hot chocolate made with a chocolate bar. You could do that at home. You don't even have to buy you know, whisk it yourself. So I mentioned that. There's some, I'm a day from Italy. Uh, I just had a really fine couple bars from Hawaii, from the north coast of Oahu. Um, it's awfully difficult for me to pick out some. The best thing for you to do is look up some of the companies that carry a wide range of chocolate. Uh, and there are a number of them. Caputo, uh, in Salt Lake City, you've got uh, Chocolate Covered in San Francisco, uh, just to name two. There's stores all over that have a huge selection. If they go to my um, Instagram account, they'll see some of the tastings I have done and some comments on it, and they may find something they like there. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned your Instagram page because I know there were a couple of additional questions that had come in. I want to be appropriate of your time, of everybody's time today. 
and I, I know in speaking with you that your Instagram page is the best way to kind of, you always welcome direct messages from anybody, uh, anybody following the show today, please uh, check out Dr. Lee Scott Tyson at, at chocolate underscore guru. I don't know of a, of a more fitting title uh, for our, for our guest today. And um, before we head out, I do want to let everybody know that chat from the old cap, we are a weekly series. We're so honored and excited to be able to talk to amazing alumni from the University of Iowa like like Dr. Tyson today. 